Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 617, and today is June 18th, 2024. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anslone, and we have a lot of news to talk about today. Please share the show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute. We repost the show on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey for the video version of the show. It's up anywhere you can listen to audio podcasts. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Kyle underscore. And I have been doing a ton of writing this week. So uh, if you haven't followed me already, you should do that. So you get all the latest stories that I'm writing up, mostly for antiwar.com. Here we go with today's show. This one from Connor Freeman. U.S. and Canadian warships arrive in Cuba during Russian naval deployment, June 16th, antiwar.com. Three re- Russian warships and one nuclear-powered submarine arrived in Havana for naval exercises this week after carrying out what Russian Defense Ministry called a high-precision missile weapons training in the Atlantic Ocean. On Friday, in what is being viewed as a response to Moscow's deployment to the Caribbean nation, a U.S. facetad submarine made an uninvited port visit to Guantanamo Bay, Additionally, a Canadian patrol vessel entered Havana Harbor. So, Vice Foreign Minister Carlos Ferdinand de Caso expressed displeasure with the advent of the American Facetad submarine Helena in Guantanamo Bay, located some 530 miles southeast of Havana, remarking that the naval visits to a country are usually the results of an invitation, and this was not the case. Obviously, we do not like the presence in our territory of a submarine belonging to a power that maintains an official and practical policy that is hostile against Cuba. Canada's Margaret Brook patrol vessel arrived in Havana Harbor hours later in what the Canadian Joint Operations Command dubbed a port visit in recognition of the long-standing bilateral relationship between Canada and Cuba. The Russian move to send warships to Cuba for training exercises, not uncommon over the last decade, is likely intended to as a flexing of Moscow's military muscle in Washington's backyard. Tensions have been boiling over NATO's proxy war with the Kremlin in Ukraine recently. Last month, Washington greenlit Kiev strikes on the Russian mainland using U.S.-provided weapons, and NATO is preparing to deploy military trainers to Ukraine. Although Havana and Washington have insisted that the Russian warships are not carrying nuclear weapons, despite their ability to do so, the ships are loaded with advanced armaments. The frigate, the convoy's lead ship, is equipped with Zygron hypersonic missiles, which Putin has said in the past can fly nine times faster than the speed of sound at a range of more than 620 miles. It also carries caliber and Oint's cruise missiles, Al Jazeera reports. Likewise, the nuclear-powered submarine Kazan is believed to be outfitted with cruise missiles. The ships are currently docked in Havana port, with residents taking tours on the various vessels. The Russian ships are expected to leave the area tomorrow. Uh, so that would have been yesterday, the 17th. I, and I, I do believe that happened. So echoes of the Cold War and quite emphatically the Cuban Missile Crisis are being felt today as Washington and Moscow challenging each other within their own uh each other's fears of influence, sending warships near each other's borders. The White House has attempted to downplay the significance of the Russian presence only dozens of miles from the U.S. coast by saying it was merely routine. Nevertheless, the U.S. has deployed multiple U.S. Navy ships uh, and ordered them to shadow the Russian vessels this week. This comes after more than a decade of myriad war games launched inside Ukraine on the Black Sea and just off Russian borders by the U.S., in some cases jointly with Ukraine or with scores of NATO states. The U.S. military's activity in close proximity to Russia's territory is usually far more provocative than the Russian deployment to Cuba. For example, in November of 2021, 
U.S. Strategic Command's Global Thunder exercises saw nuclear-capable warplanes and strategic bombers flying within 12.4 miles of the Russian border and simulating a nuclear attack. There have been 30 such flights that month, and according to Russia's defense minister, American bombers' activity near his country's border had increased 2.5 times compared to the previous year. In July of 2021, Washington and Kiev hosted the so-called Sea Breeze War Games in the Black Sea, involving the participation of warships and naval personnel from more than 30 countries. Just before the drills, a British destroyer caused an international incident by sailing within 12 nautical miles miles of the Crimean coast. This led the Russian Navy to fire warning shots and drop bombs in the path to turn it around. A cache of secret weapons and sensitive British military documents later revealed this was the deliberate provocation that London had engineered. In recent weeks, Moscow has made multiple overtures towards peace talks with Washington to end the war in Ukraine along the current battle lines. These requests have been flatly denied by the U.S. and Ukraine. When asked about the message conveyed to the U.S. by the Russian Navy activity in Cuba right now, Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharivia said, As soon as it comes to exercises or sea voyages, we immediately hear questions and desire to know what the messages are about. She continued lamenting, Why do only signals related to only to your navy and our our navy and army with reach with the west despite the long-standing relationship with cuba moscow and havana have developed closer ties during the past several years this is a result of both donald trump and joe biden's administrations tightened sanctions against both countries and the economy economic pains Cuba has suffered particularly since the COVID-19 pandemic. And one more thing, you know, just to add on to this story, it doesn't seem like Russia is doing the, uh, you know, trying to carry out any particular military provocation here. They're not going to get, you know, 13, 12 miles from the U.S. coastline or anything like that. Uh, But they are seeming to try to get as much attention to these war games as possible. And I do think that is meant to be a, you know, signal to the West that like, hey, you're in our sphere of influence and we do have the ability to uh, cause disruptions in yours as well. Next up, I wrote this one for Antiwar.com on June 17th, NATO mulling increasing nuclear deployments. So NATO is considering whether to move nuclear weapons out of storage and place them on standby. The civilian head of the alliance, Jens Stoltenberg, also called on member states to increase spending on weapons. In an interview with The Telegraph published on Sunday, Secretary General Stoltenberg said the bloc could soon bring more of its nuclear weapons online. He's told the outlet, I won't go into operational details about how many nuclear warheads should be operational and which should be stored, but we need to consult on these issues, and that's exactly what they're, we're doing. While the official noted that transparency is an important part of nuclear doctrine, he did not indicate how NATO's nuclear policy might change other than by expanding the number of operational nuclear weapons. NATO's largest nuclear NATO's largest nuclear power the US has about 1700 deployed nuclear weapons additionally France and the UK have smaller nuclear stockpiles Stoltenberg explained that part of NATO's rationale for expanding its nuclear capabilities was to counter China's expanding arsenal Beijing's growing military capabilities have come in response to Washington's growing role in the region and international arms watchdog released a report on Sunday saying China's nuclear arsenal increased from 410 to 500 nuclear warheads last year. That report also notes that 80% of the new spending on nuclear weapons was spending by Washington and not by Beijing. And so most of the spending and increase in spending on nuclear weapons is coming from the U.S. as a part of our multi-trillion dollar plan to upgrade our nuclear arsenal. So just going over some of the provocations of the U.S. uh, towards China, 
President Barack Obama kicked off, and of course, Trump and Biden continued. The world's largest military buildup since World War II in the co countries and islands surrounding China. Washington signed the AUKUS pact with Australia and UK that will see more nuclear submarines operating in the area. And additionally, the White House has engaged in talks with Taiwan to bring Taipei under Washington's nuclear umbrella. Beijing has characterized all these actions as provocative. Stoltenberg also used the interview to call on members of the alliance to spend more on weapons, even if it means difficult cuts to domestic programs. He said, the reality is we're, we all reduced defense spending when tensions went down at the end of the Cold War, and now we need to increase this fence when tensions are going up. I was prime minister for 10 years. I know that it's hard to find money for defense because most politicians always prefer to spend money on health, education, infrastructure, and other important tasks. Um, but said that, you know, they need to find the money anyways. And it's just, it should really be an indictment of NATO, Washington, the empire's policy that at the end, you know, we're, we're back to the level of the Cold War where we had to increase defense spending, where we have this nuclear tension, this potential for nuclear Armageddon with Russia once again, uh, you know, Russian war games in Cuba, U.S. war games in the Black and Baltic Sea. You know, these, these are major provocations that should not be happening. And the fact that they are should really be seen, I, I think, as an indictment of, again, you know, NATO, Stoltenberg, Biden. Trump, Obama, the, the whole, you know, post-Cold War foreign policy towards Russia. All right, next up here, Netanyahu dissolves war cabinet, consolidates power. I wrote this one for antiwar.com on June 17th. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dissolved the Israeli war cabinet after two of uh, it sits members left. The Israeli leader will form a small coalition body of the remaining four members to make decisions about the war in Gaza. So on Monday, Netanyahu disbanded the war cabinet after Benny Gantz and another minister resigned from the body. The war cabinet was set up as a unity coalition in response to the October 7th attack to advise the Israeli leader about decisions on the war in Gaza. However, Gantz and Netanyahu have disagreed on potentially negotiating with Hamas to get the remaining Israeli hostages released. After Netanyahu effectively killed a ceasefire agreement that would have seen the release of Israeli hostages, Gantz and Eisenkot left the war cabinet. Now, I want to just go over a couple of the, a little bit of the deeper background here and some of the tensions I, I think we see between Gantz and Netanyahu. I think Gantz is looking at this far more from a, a military strategic, like, how do we win this war, right? If our goal is to defeat Hamas, get the, the hostages back, what's the best way to do that? And I think from Gantz's viewpoint, what you do is you cut deals on temporary ceasefires with Hamas, and you get as many of the hostages released as possible, and then, you know, you continue the military operations to defeat uh, Hamas, and then you set up a political solution made up of the Palestinian Authority, maybe Arab countries, the U.S., with Israeli security forces to have a uh, civil administration in Gaza. I think that's kind of Gantz's vision. Netanyahu's vision is far harder to discern, and he won't put it out publicly. It is clear that he is unwilling to accept a ceasefire agreement that would be aimed at. Um, you know, releasing the hostages. I think Netanyahu's calculation is that if he were to agree to that, it would be really hard to start the fighting again after. There would probably be a lot of pressure from the Americans not to do so. Uh, so I think that's one reason that Netanyahu is tentative. But I think the other reason is something we'll be talking about soon, that the Israeli plans for Gaza call for moving at least Israel to uh, Israelis in, in reestablishing settlements, at least in limited areas of the Gaza Strip, if not forcing all the Palestinians out and just resettling the entire territory with Israelis. And so Netanyahu obviously can't put that plan forward. And, and I wonder if, you know, these are some of the like bigger differences between Gantz and Netanyahu. So other Israeli ministers initially sought to fill the open seats from Gantz and the other minister. To prevent this, Netanyahu dissolved the body and designed a small 
forum for the remaining war cabinet members to make decisions about the war in Gaza. The new group includes Netanyahu himself, Defense Minister Yoav Galan, Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer, and Shalas leader Ala Dari, and then he added national security head Tazish Hagabi. Uh, Dreamer and Deary are reported to be confidence, confidants of Netanyahu, and G uh, Gallant, I understand, is not always on the best terms with Netanyahu. So uh, it does seem that Netanyahu is going to have a majority of people on this small council that support what he wants, and, and not that this is necessarily like a democracy and that they're going to sit there and vote on everything, but you have to imagine that if two or three of the four people in the room disagree with the one and the prime minister is with the majority, that would be a uh, pretty good blank check for him to just kind of do what he wants. So a sport, uh, source speaking with Haaretz said Netanyahu wanted to consolidate power to prevent the far-right ministers from filling the seats. The source said, in practice, there is no substantial change in the decision-making process, but Netanyahu's announcement to dissolve the war cabinet allows National Security Minister Itmar Ben-Gavir to step back and not insist on being part of the limited decision-making forum. I do wonder, really, if it's Ben Gavir that Netanyahu was worried about being on this cabinet, or if they're just saying that, oh, we're concerned it's Ben Gavir and Smoltrich because they're politically unpopular, at least with the U.S., right? Like, you know, we, we condemn the far-right extremists, and we blame the far-right extremists for what the Israeli government's coalition, government go, governing coalition is doing. And so... You know, I, I wonder if that is more a statement to try to give cover to what Netanyahu is doing. And so I just finished up the article here. While Netanyahu may want to exclude Ben Gavir from decision making, the two agree on many issues about the war. After the Israeli military announced it would pause fighting along the road in Gaza to allow aid trucks to enter the Strip, both Netanyahu and Gavir rebuked the IDF for the policy. All right, next up here, this one from Will Porter, June 17th, antiwar.com. Israeli lawmakers push for Gaza resettlement. So two far right Israeli members of the Knesset have formed a new legislative caucus seeking to reestablish Jewish settlement in the Gaza Strip. The territory was vacated by settlers following a government order in 2005 and has been kept under tight blockade ever since. Dubbed the Knesset Caucus for the Renewal of Settlement in the Gaza Strip, the group was announced on Monday in a statement by M.K. Zivi Sukut and the religious of the religious Zionism party and MK Lamor Son Har Melek, a member of the far right Jewish power faction. So I believe these are uh, Ben Gavir and small churches parties here, the members of the Knesset from those two parties. The lawmakers argue that the settlement in Gaza is a necessary step to protect. Israel's security and ensure its future, adding only a dense presence of Jewish settlements throughout Gaza will be possible to prevent the continuation of terrorist threats and deter the enemy. Though President uh, though Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has stated Israel has no plans to govern Gaza following the current war with Hamas, other top officials have loudly endorsed new settlements. During an ultra-nationalist rally in May, National Security Chief Itmar Ben-Gavir stressed the need for voluntary immigration by Palestinians to make room for Israelis. And that voluntary immigration is his statement. That's what they, they called in Israel, uh, forcing all the Palestinians to leave. I think it's a really ugly term and I kind of hate saying it, but I do think it really exposes what Israel is trying to do in Gaza. They're trying to make it so unlivable that all the Palestinians just leave. And we've had uh, the finance minister, Betzel Smoltrich, 
likewise backing uh, the idea. So last January, more than a dozen government ministers and a group of Knesset members attended a conference to discuss a return to Gaza, including uh, the two ministers who formed this new caucus. Ben Gavir and Smoltrich were billed as key speakers in the event. The creation of a Jewish community in Gaza would almost certainly entail a permanent Israeli security presence, as is currently the case in the occupied West Bank. However, Tel Aviv has so far failed to offer a clear post-war plan for the territory. Israel's 2005 pullout from Gaza saw 21 settlements unilaterally dismantled with some reluctant residents even forcibly removed by the military. While officials have presented the move as a concession to the Palestinians, a chief architect of the disengagement policy, Dov Weisglass, explained in the, the policy to Haaretz in no uncertain terms. He said, the significance of the Dej engagement plan is the freezing of the peace process. And when he made this statement, he was a top aide to then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. And when you freeze the process, you prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state and you prevent the discussion of the refugees, the border, and Jerusalem. Effectively, the whole package called the Palestinian state with all that it is entails has been removed indefinitely from our agenda. And so I think if Israel would go back to settling Gaza, it would largely be cleared of Palestinians first. And Smoltrich has talked about reducing the number of Palestinians in Gaza from 2.3 million to one to 200,000. All right, next up here, nothing has changed since Israel announced limited humanitarian pause. Uh, I wrote this one for the antiwar.com on June 17th. The head of the UN aid agency for Palestinians, UNRWA, said there has no, been no change on the ground since Israel's military claimed it would open a humanitarian aid route in Gaza. After the Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, announced it would pause fighting in a limited area during daylight hours, the Israeli Prime Minister denounced the decision. On Monday, UNRWA Chief Felipe Lanzare said the IDF's pause has done little to improve the situation in Gaza. He explained, There has been information that such a decision has been taken, but the political level says none of this decision has been taken. So for the time being, I can tell you that the hostilities continue in Rafa and in the south of Gaza and that operationally nothing has changed yet. The IDF said it was continuing operations in Gaza near the location of the humanitarian aid route. After a slower initial ground attack, Israeli soldiers recently pushed deeper into the central and western regions of Rafah, and this is the area of Gaza where that road crosses. So on Sunday, Tel Aviv announced it would pause military operations during daylight hours along a seven-mile stretch of road in Gaza to relieve a backlog of aid shipments. However, after the policy was rolled out, Israeli officials were quick to downplay and denounce the humanitarian corridor. So the IDF spokesperson appeared to minimize the significance of the pause. He said, there is no sensation of fighting in the southern Gaza Strip and the fighting in Rafah continues. Also, there is no change in the introduction of goods into the Gaza Strip. The access carrying the goods will be open during the day in coordination with international organizations for the transportation of humanitarian aid only. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu found even a limited halt to the fighting unacceptable, while National Security Minister Itmar Ben Gavir said whoever came up with the idea is a fool and should be fined. The IDF announcement came as nearly all Palestinians living in Gaza are suffering from severe deprivation and in need of humanitarian assistance. The UN aid agency for children, UNICEF, recently warned that about 90% of kids in Gaza lack nutrition and face severe threats to their survival, growth, and development. Just this morning, I saw UNRWA put out a, a statement that said that 50,000 uh, Palestinian children are now either facing moderate or severe malnutrition, and, and this is, you know, putting them in the potential death zone. Very, very concerning. So aid deliveries in southern Gaza have been significantly curtailed by the Israeli military operations over the past month. In the 30 days following the Israeli assault on Rafah, the number of aid shipments entering Gaza plummeted to 68 per day, 
far short of the minimum 500 needed to sustain the population. And even that is, uh, you know, a bare minimum to, to just keep things going without completely falling apart. All right, next up here, another one from our friend Will Porter. Israel's top court suspends October 7th probe. So Will writes, the Israeli High Court of Justice has ordered the government to halt its investigation into intelligence failings in the lead up of Hamas's October 7th attack. The move comes after the court received classified briefings from security agencies, some of which have publicly opposed the probe. In an interim ruling on Sunday, just uh, the justice paused the investigation until the court can hear arguments from its opponents next month. So uh, the judge wrote in her ruling in view of the complex security reality, the planned scope of the investigation, which will deal, among other things, with the combat support system and core operational issues and preparation required to respond to the investigation at the current time. I order suspension of the investigation procedures in everything that relates to the IDF and Shin Bet, uh, she wrote in her ruling. Launched in December by State Comptroller Mary Anhu Engelman, the probe sought to audit major security and intelligence failures ahead of Hamas's deadly attack last year, which was not stopped despite a number of warnings. However, the investigation has faced opposition from a long time, a long time, a long line of top officials, among them Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The Prime Minister's cabinet secretary attempted to stop the probe during an early meeting with Engelman, while the chief of the IDF uh, similarly urged the comptroller to hold off until the war in Gaza has come to an end. The army chief reportedly told Engelman that any external investigation would distract commanders and harm the ability and quality of the IDF's ongoing operational probe, as well as prevent implementing the lessons necessary to achieve war goals. In response, Engelman said that the severe failures that led to the events of October 7th require a deep and fundamental explanation and stressed that the team has been instructed to carry out the probe in a way that did not divert commander's attention from the war. Several former defense officials have also opposed the intelligence audit, while some who joined the activist group Moment for Movement for Government Movement for Quality Government MQG to petition the courts in February, the state attorney's office has publicly supported that effort, also arguing that the probe would damage Israel's war effort. So the attorney general submitted a legal opinion to the high court last month to make the same case. The MQG petition is what ultimately prompted Sunday's ruling. In addition to the October 7th intelligence failure, the IDF and other security agencies have also faced pressure to investigate friendly fire incidents during the Hamas attack, including the shelling of a home full of hostages in a kibbutz near the Gaza border. The military said the said it opened a probe into the matter last winter and cleared the commanders involved of any wrongdoing. And so it does seem like if they stretch this war out long enough, the first argument's going to be, oh, we can't conduct the probe because uh, the war's ongoing, and then it's going to be, oh, the, it happened so long ago, what's the point of doing it? All right, so next up here, there is a three c series of articles published by the Associated Press on Israel wiping out entire Palestinian families. So I took a chunk of just one of those articles uh, to, to talk to you about here on the show today. But overall, if you're interested in this, I would check out reading that whole three-part series. It's, I mean, very dark, extremely sad, but also uh, really does show the extent uh, of just the mass indiscriminate slaughter that Israel has conducted in Gaza. So the Associated Press reports, he is one of the very last survivors of his Gaza family, a clan so close that they knew without thinking how blood and marriage bound them across generational and city blots. Then, branch by branch, 137 members of Yusuf uh, Salem's relatives were killed in Israeli airstrikes in a matter of days in December. By spring, that death toll had risen to 270. Bones and flesh soon 
over the ruins of family homes, blonde curls of cousins peeking through Brits, unrecognizable bodies piled on a donkey cart, lines of burial shrouds. These images are what survivors are left with from hundreds of families in Gaza. Um, and so to a degree never seen before, Israel is killing entire Palestinian families, a loss even more devastating than the physical destruction and the mass displacement. An Associated Press investigation identified at least 60 Palestinian families where at least 25 people were killed, sometimes four generations from the same bloodline, in bombings between October and December, the deadliest and most destructive period of the war. Nearly a quarter of those families lost more than 50 members in those weeks. Several families have almost no one left to document the toll, especially as documenting and sharing information became harder. So Yosef uh, Salem's hard drive is stocked with photos of the dead. He spent months filling a spreadsheet with their vital details as news of their deaths was confirmed to preserve a last link to the web of relationships he thought would thrive for generations more. The Associated Press Review encompassed casualty records released by Gaza's health ministry in March, online death notices, family and neighborhood social media pages and spreadsheets, witness and survivor accounts, as well as casualty data from Air Wars, a London-based conflict uh, monitor. The Maghrabi family, more than 70, were killed in a single Israeli airstrike in December. The Abu Najas, over 50, were killed in an October strike, including at least two pregnant women. The Dogmosh Klan lost at least 44 members in a strike on a mosque. The AP documented over 100 family members killed in the following weeks. By the spring, over 80 members of the Abu al Qasman family were killed. And so it's just, I mean, I can't even imagine if you were a part of a community and you, you finally, you found out that not only were thousands of people from your community killed but entire families at a time that that just no longer have been wiped out is just incredibly disturbing all right next up here and last article on today's show i wrote this one on june 16th at antiwar.com u.s concerned israel could drag u.s into war in lebanon so u.s officials are increasingly concerned israel is preparing for a large assault on lebanon the Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, and Hezbollah militants have been exchanging missile fire on a near-daily basis over the past eight months. Officials speaking with CBS News outlined multiple scenarios that could lead to a broader war in the Middle East, with some suggesting Israel is gearing up for a major attack on Lebanon. If Israel does start a war with Hezbollah, American officials say Tel Aviv would need to end need the U.S. to end the conflict. On Wednesday, Atsios reported that Washington is concerned that Tel Aviv will rush into a war in Lebanon. Since January, the White House has been anxious that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu would expend hostilities with Hezbollah to boost his domestic political standing. Over the past eight months, Israeli officials have expressed a desire and willingness to invade southern ne Lebanon, with Netanyahu saying Tel Aviv was prepared for a very intense operation against Hezbollah earlier this month. CBS News spoke with officials who say the White House is working behind the scenes to prevent that outcome. While the U.S. support is crucial to keeping Tel Aviv's war machine running, several previous American presidents have exerted pressure to curb Israel's militarism. Officials presented a second possibility in which tit-for-tat strikes between Hezbollah militants and the IDF escalate to a full-scale war. Under this scenario, an Israeli deep strike in Lebanon would trigger a larger missile barrage by Hezbollah. If the group's leadership miscalculated the size of the strike, it could prompt a major Israeli assault in response. The ongoing tit-for-tat warfare is causing problems in Israel, as hundreds of thousands of civilians have been displaced by the country's war with uh, near the country's border with Lebanon. Additionally, Tel Aviv has been forced to dedicate some of its military resources to its northern border, tying up troops that 
that could be used for operations in Gaza and the West Bank. UN officials have also expressed on ease that the war will expand. The United States United Nations Special Coordinator for Lebanon and the head of the UN Peacekeeping Forces in Lebanon said they were deeply concerned over the current tensions. A statement from the officials published on Saturday explained the danger of miscalculation leading to a sudden wider conflict is very real. The White House assesses that ending the war in Gaza will lead to a reduction in attacks between the IDF and Hezbollah. However, some analysts disagree and believe Tel Aviv would take ending operations against Hamas as an opportunity for a larger war with Hezbollah. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for the show today. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I will be back with more later in the week and keep an eye on antiwar.com where I should be writing a bunch of articles today.